Good morning, friends. Although it's a bit awkward, I'm going to read today. And frankly, that's because I don't want to forget what to say or how to say it. Turns out that the title of this reflection is actually going to be our prayer as we begin, straight out of Scripture. So here it is. We don't know what to do. Thus our eyes are upon you, O Lord. Amen. That's Second Chronicles. We'll return to it shortly. In God's good providence, our chapel theme this semester has been hope, and it continues to be hope. Even though disturbing images daily bombard our wounded senses, and confusion relentlessly chips away at our own thought processes. Perhaps at this time we encounter the word hope with some incredulity. Two weeks ago, did we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today with joy and hope? Can we continue to proclaim with every fiber of our being that what ranges around us is not the last word? Walter Brueggemann's way of putting the latter was, and I quote, the work of ministry is to render the virus as penultimate, to see that even its lethal force is outflanked by the goodness of God. May it be so, even as we are fully cognizant of the dark tentacles of destruction and, yes, pandemic evil of which COVID-19 is but one manifestation. Just before Holy Week, when we were still coming to grips with the radical changes unfolding around us, Dr. Hughes reminded us that the Holy Spirit is our advocate and is thus our hope. Her text was John 14, where Jesus promised that the paraclete would be with us. Shortly after these promises, Jesus declared as he was facing his arrest, trial, and crucifixion, he declared, Take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16. Because that is indeed true with generations of saints through time and around the globe, we hail our risen master and we welcome him to be master on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We wholeheartedly affirm the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And therein lies our hope. Nevertheless, we do live with disturbing uncertainties. The title of this brief homily is the close of a crisis prayer uttered by King Jehoshaphat. That was more than 2,500 years ago, but it pretty much captures how I feel an awful lot of the time. Again, I quote, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. And thus our eyes are upon you, O Lord. You can read the narrative details in 2 Chronicles 20. Here's the thumbnail sketch. As God's people were severely threatened by hostile armies, they had the good sense to gather in the temple and seek help from the Lord. And when the king stood up to pray, he first declared, first, God's powerful faithfulness on behalf of his people. And then he described the overwhelming odds against them. And then he closed with these words, We don't know what to do. Thus our eyes are upon you. Picking up at this point in the narrative, I've got three th simple hooks on which to hang our thoughts. They're simple. Praying, listening, and singing. Yes, singing. Turns out these seriously endangered people did quite a bit of singing. Now, even though none of us are kings, priests, prophets, or Israelites, and our contexts are quite different, the access that we continue to have to our merciful God is still wide open. First, praying. If you're like me, you feel generally useless in overwhelming and monstrous situations. It does not seem if there's anything really life-saving or heroic that we can do. We ask ourselves what faithfulness really looks like in these circumstances. As the news incessantly informs us that the world is in crisis, we feel powerless. We are, however, really missing the most important work we can be doing in this or any situation because we have absorbed an insidious lie and we repeat it, usually with a resigned sigh. It runs sort of like this. All I can do is pray. How often have I said that? But what a disastrous worldview. It presumes that my efforts 
if I had a clue what they could possibly be, would be of much more consequence than whatever God might possibly be persuaded to do. And it may play into a nagging desire to be noticed. After all, how many news stories are there about folks on their knees? And yet we have significant biblical figures, in addition to Jehoshaphat, who prayed in dire circumstances. Solomon, Hezekiah, Isaiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Jesus, and the list goes on. But speaking of Jesus, let's revisit the Garden of Gethsemane, a name that has come to have such a stained glass aura that we lose sight of the fact that it means olive press, got shemen, and that means a place where people worked really hard processing olive oil. Gethsemane was the place that the Lord of the universe chose to offer his prayer. Working hard that night as he faced the seemingly impossible task yet to come. His prayer can be our paradigmatic prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. He uttered that between his declaration in the upper room, we've mentioned it already, that he has overcome the world, and that horrific journey to death. As we pray, we must be determined to hammer the portals of heaven. This is anything but easy, and I don't claim to be good at it. I just know we need to bring our hearts to the discipline of prayer because it will be the only at the foot of the cross, only at the gates of heaven, only at the mercy seat that we will find hope. Now, please do not take what I'm about to describe as a one-size-fits-all recipe for successful prayer. As I just said, I'm the last person to dish that out. With that caveat, however, here's what I've found helpful. In God's good providence, I need to walk every day, no matter what. If I did not, I would be an invalid, and I don't exaggerate. I'll explain the background to that a bit more later on. Although it took me far too long to put this together for myself, I've found that the daily space early in the morning for my walk is sacred space for praying, and it is absolutely necessary. After all, being an invalid does not only apply to our physical being. My walk lasts over an hour, rain, snow, wind, not deterrence. And even though I often fritter away way too much of it, planning, worrying, generally focusing on myself, I'm nevertheless blessed with that sacred time, as God's Spirit repeatedly draws my wandering thoughts back into his presence. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I trust you get the connection. That was supremely his prayer focus in Gethsemane, and what he was about to do had everything to do with the kingdom. We can spend a lifetime practicing those two petitions. And now, as we grieve before God's throne over our broken, pained world. But for now, let me simply note the following. In response to Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, the Lord himself declared in response, notice the avenue back and forth. Here it is, quote, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's us folks, by the way, if my people, in case we missed it. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. In effect, about a century later, Jehoshaphat was doing just that in his prayer. And three millennia later, we are invited to do so as well. Our human nature and need have not changed. We're all broken people, communities, nations, globe, deeply in need of confession and healing. Well, I did reference three hangers. In response to Jehoshaphat's pray, prayer, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through one of the Levites who was present. Listen, he said. Listen. It's not your strength on which you depend. It's the Lord's battle. But nevertheless, he went on, they were to get themselves in position in order to see the Lord's deliverance. He would be with them. As they set out the next morning, the king stood up and told them again, Listen. Listen. 
Believe and your belief will be strengthened. Believe. Just an additional few thoughts on this matter of listening and trusting. Because that would be another series of homilies, wouldn't it? But for now, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Even though much of what Jesus was going to say in the immediate future would be really, really difficult to hear. I wonder how well we really listen to Jesus, especially when we're distracted, trying to sort out the cacophony of dissonant, confused, and angry voices around us. So for right now, it's not about what would Jesus do as much as what did he say? So let's listen. I want to set four words, just four, from Jesus on the table, sort of hors d'oeuvres, and invite you to have your own rich feast later when you truly can savor them. Maybe in the company of other fellow listeners. Read them to each other. These words come from John 13 through 17, the passage where we've already been dabbling. And I realize I'm being highly selective in these. They're among Jesus' final words to his disciples in that upper room. The immediate future was ominous. We feel that same dark weight as well, and these words are for us. And as a matter of fact, they are things we can do. First, Jesus commanded them and us to love each other and keep his commandments. Second, Jesus admonished them and us to trust that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and is preparing a place for us. Now therein lies hope. Third, Jesus commanded them and us to abide in him. The image is the vine and the branches. That's a life-sustaining connection, and it's founded on the word, the word written, the word incarnate. Of course, for branches to bear fruit, they need radical pruning. That's both a warning of what to expect, but an incredibly profound encouragement. And then fourth, Jesus prayed for our protection from the evil one. In other words, that we will be born safely through the raging conflicts, some of them truly diabolical, that are and will be part of our realities. He prayed that we would be made holy in the truth. The implications here are far-reaching, of course. He prayed for complete unity. These all require the ongoing work of the Spirit, don't they? It's a good thing that earlier Jesus promised that very Spirit's presence with us. Praying, listening, singing. Returning to King Jehoshaphat, turns out he consulted with the people that morning as they set out. And they began to sing to the Lord and praise God for his splendor and majestic glory. What a remarkable scene, facing that kind of dire threat. What a remarkable scene, and what a mighty chorus. They sang, give thanks to the Lord for his chesed endures forever. Chesed, unfailingly loyal covenant love from God to his people. As they sang, God masterminded the battle. You can read all about it. And when it was over, they returned to Jerusalem, and they continued to bless the Lord with an exultant concert. Let me draw this forward to our 21st century. Some of you know that I come from a family that sang. And by the way, there's a fine point to be made here. We were not singers in the sense that we were any good at it, but we sang a lot. One of my earliest memories was my dad singing to us every night, making up long musical sagas on the spot about whatever plans he had for his next day's activities. We loved it. I only later learned that this was one source of solace for his own anxieties and fears. In addition, for years we sang our family blessing over the evening meal. Our old hymn books were widely used because we tried to avoid singing only favorites. That family habit continued and it gained much more traction for me later, later, after I was prodded by the Holy Spirit into the family of God as a first-year college student but that's another story altogether. Although I never really set out to memorize hymns, in God's perfect timing, there were a number of occasions where that happened, 
just in time, as it were, to face particularly challenging life situations. Battles in their own right, if you will. I'll simply mention two. In June of 1976, freshly graduated from seminary, Perry and I departed for study in Israel. It was an extraordinarily wonderful year, which actually turned into three, but it was also challenging. One slice of the wonderful was attending the Scottish Presbyterian Church, where we sang from the Psalter every week. By December of that year, I had a whole battery of psalms in my heart. The most challenging part was that in a major hiking mishap in January, I severely injured my back. As the excruciating pain intensified over the next two months, with, by the way, nothing to dull it effectively, I became virtually paralyzed from the waist down, fearful that I would never walk again. At that time, I was about 25, so use your imagination. Navigating the Israeli medical system was also a challenge. That, too, is a long story for another time. But finally, I was admitted as an emergency case and immediately scheduled for surgery. This was Israel, and it was 1977. To be sure, Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem was the medical showplace of the Middle East. But it was a far cry from even rudimentary hospital care as we now know it in this country. As I was lying on some sort of table in a pre-operating room, I could hear breaking glass along with other noises that did not set my heart at rest. In the midst of that, however, I was inexplicably compelled to sing the psalms I had learned over the preceding six months. I'll admit, I was singing them through tears. But nevertheless, I was rehearsing God's promise promises of faithfulness in stanza after stanza after stanza of, of all things, metrical psalms. And in an indescribable shift, the sound of breaking glass was no longer a terrifying threat. Whatever would happen next was no longer a paralyzing fear. Through no work of my own, no work of my own, I was resting in God's powerful word. Now, I know this is a small thing in contrast to global alterations of reality, but it's an important reminder for me of God's unfailing faithfulness. Indeed, in God's infinite mercy, two excellent surgeons operated successfully, and after regimented hard work for weeks, I was able to walk and eventually run again. Be assured that I thank the Lord daily for the gift of walking and that daily sacred space to walk. I will tell you that two months later to the day, I slowly climbed Mount Sinai to be sure I was the last of the small group that did it, but we were thankful. Second instance of singing hymns. Fast forward to 2010, when my dear mother of blessed memory came to live with us at the age of 96. She brought her gentle and always thankful spirit into our midst. Caring for her until she was ushered into glory at the age of 100 was a joy. And our singing expanded beyond the traditional one hymn before supper. Each evening as we tucked her into bed, we sang at least three, sometimes more. And especially the last six months of her life, as she slowly faded from us, We were tenderly wrapped with resounding theological truths. In those days, as I walked every morning, I sang, because you see, so many of those hymns are prayers, personalized for dear ones, brought to my mind by the Holy Spirit of God. I could spend the rest of my time this morning savoring hymn texts with you because they are resonant with truth, encouraging truth. I will, however, offer you stanzas just several stanzas from two of my mother's favorites. And I think many of you know these. I invite you to speak them with me slowly, not sing. Singing is wonderful. You wouldn't want that from me at this point. And besides, I'm not going to keep them necessarily rhythmic. The first one. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me save that thou art Thou my best thought by day or by night. 
waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. High King of heaven, my victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? And one verse of a second hymn. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Pause. That was Jehoshaphat's prayer, wasn't it? Thy mercies how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Prior to my showing up this morning, I'm hopeful that you heard my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. With the refrain, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of their ground is sinking sand. But one of my favorites of those verses is the one that runs like this. His oath, his covenant, his blood. Support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay on Christ the solid rock I stand. Good theology. Just one more. We could do this all day, but not to worry. With a nod to our great cloud of witnesses referred to in Hebrews chapter 12, the hymn for all the saints has seven stanzas, all of which are heartening. But here are my favorites for now. Thou wast their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. And in the darkness drear, their one true light. Alleluia. Did you catch that stanza is a prayer in the midst of a battle? Remember, Jesus is praying for us when we are in the midst of battles. Here's the second verse. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long steals on the ear of the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again and arms are strong. Alleluia. And then a third one. O oh, blessed communion. Fellowship divine, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine, for all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia. All are one in thee. That was Jesus' prayer, John chapter 17. I started with reference to Resurrection Sunday and the hope we have, the unfailing hope. Just about a week ago, one of my students Many of you know Ellie Weiner wrote ever so eloquently the following, and I quote, This cry of resurrection arises from desperate souls, pining with all of their hearts for the new creation, intent on hope and healing. Desperate for the spirit of the living God to breathe warm life into cold and hurting hearts. Desperate for the kingdom of God to come and the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven desperate for joyful praise to be the rhythm of our days and the unrelenting song of eternity. The Saturday of Holy Week, I listened to Gustav Mahler's Resurrection Symphony. It's music that has, for almost half a century, moved my often cold and hurting heart. Even if its style is maybe a tad bit foreign to you, Listen for the inexpressible and exultant hope that bursts forth in the last several minutes. Here, in closing, is part of the text that is being sung in German that you will hear. It's from a poem by a man named Friedrich, Friedrich Klopstock. Here's the poem. Oh, believe, my heart, believe. You were not born for nothing, have not for nothing lived, suffered. What was created must perish, what perish, rise again. Cease from trembling, prepare yourself to live. O oh, pain, you piercer of all things, from you I have been wrested. O oh, death, you conqueror of all things, now you are conquered. I shall soar upwards to the light which no eye has penetrated. Die shall I in order to live. Rise again. Yes, rise again. Amen and amen.